I'd like to talk a little bit about one of the writers that we have for this week, Edith Wharton, pictured here in the late 1920s uh, when she was uh, still regarded as, as one of America's most successful writers. Wharton was born in 1862 in New York City uh, to a fairly wealthy family, the kind of family, in fact, that we see a little bit of in um, <clears throat> Roman fever. Uh, she married in 1885 to Teddy Edward Teddy Wharton, and this is Edward Wharton up here. Um, he was an alcoholic. He suffered from depression. He was 13 years older than she was. Um, but they stayed married for about 28 years, and she divorced him finally in 1913. Uh, they traveled extensively. They lived in Europe for a while. They lived in Newport, Rhode Island. They lived in New York City. Um, <clears throat> but by the time she divorced him, she had been living in Europe for a number of years. Um, and she spent the rest of her life in France, dying in 1937. Uh, during World War I, uh, Wharton organized relief for refugees, for French and Belgian refugees. So um, she was actually a very active participant in World War I in the kind of activity that a woman who was um, a little older, I mean, by this time she was in her 50s, uh, <clears throat> would do, and she was quite successful at it. Her first published work is not fiction, but a book about interior design, one of the relatively early interior design works. Uh, published in the United States. And this picture in the middle here is sort of about the same time uh, as the book came out in 1897. So this is a photograph of her after she was married. Um, this photograph that you probably can't see very well is probably about 10 years earlier when she was in her teens. Um, she built a house in 1902 called The Mount in Western Massachusetts that I've been to. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of designed around the advice that she offers in the book. It's a book that really has stood up. Uh, I've read it. Um, my wife and I use it as sort of a, a guide to our own house, which looks nothing like the Mount. Um, her first major success was a book called The House of Mirth, published in 1905. And it's a New York story about a woman who is from high society but doesn't have any money and is trying to find a husband and the one person she wants to marry really isn't interested in women um but they get along real well at any rate uh it's a very tragic novel um but it became a, a very commercial success um and really established wharton as a major writer in the early part of the 20th century wharton is one of those relatively rare writers who is not only a critical success in that we study her uh, in American literature courses, but she is also someone who is uh, was commercially successful as well. And even though she came from a wealthy family and she married a pretty rich guy, um, she really made her living from writing and was one of the relatively few uh, women who managed to do both. Uh, in the 19th century, there were carloads of women novelists who wrote romances and detective stories, the kind of what we call genre fiction um, that I read mostly um, when I'm not reading stuff for class. I read a lot of detective stories. You'd be surprised, almost all British. Uh, and I read a lot of thrillers um, as well as, you know, serious literature. But um, all the women writers from that period, from the late 19th, early 20th centuries that wrote this kind of genre fiction, we don't study them much because their fiction's not that interesting. It's predictable. <clears throat> it follows a formula. The characters are, are not that well developed. Um, but Wharton really stands out in this period as somehow being able to uh, do both. Uh, she wrote a number of novels, a total of 15 altogether. The Custom of the Country, The Buccaneers was her last one. Um, <clears throat> I've read, I think, all of them, The Reef, uh, and they were fairly fairly successful novels. Her second big one was The Age of Innocence. Some of you might have seen the film version of that uh, some years ago. <clears throat> that was published in 1921, and it was the first time the Pulitzer Prize for fiction was ever won by a woman. <clears throat> As the slide says, she wrote a total of 15 novels, seven novellas, um, one of which is Ethan Frome here, which some of you might have read in high school. It's about a, a man who falls in love with a beautiful woman uh, because he's married to an ugly one. And somehow he ends up, he, fall, he he hoping he can kill his first wife. And instead, he ends up living with two uh, profoundly crippled 
ugly women by the end of the story. It's a it's a crazy story set in New England at the end of the 19th century. Um, so that's one of her novellas, 85 short stories, one of which is Roman Fever, one of her last stories. She also wrote about a dozen books altogether on travel, and she wrote memoirs. Um, and she's a pretty keen observer of the social scene. Very wide-ranging writer and a really interesting person, I think. This is her home, the Mount, in Lenox, Massachusetts, in the Berkshires, in the western part of the state. Uh, as I said, she built it in 1902 around these design principles. Uh, my wife and I visited it in the late 1990s when it was in the process of being restored, and it was a mess. I mean, it, it uh, most there was no paint that was intact, things, walls were peeling, things were moved around, uh, the roof was leaking. And since then, as you can see from these photographs, uh, it's been restored. Uh, and it really is a gorgeous, gorgeous setting. The gardens are beautiful. They're designed by Wharton as well as the interior. This is the living room. Uh, this is the dining room, the, the large formal dining room. This is an upstairs hallway that goes, that, that connects all the bedrooms. And this is Wharton's bedroom. Uh, so you can get an idea of what the inside looked like. It really is a gorgeous place. And if you go there and you see just the grounds, which is what I was able to see, and my wife and I wandered around inside for quite a while, looking at largely empty rooms with a lot of uh, sort of restoration bits and pieces lying around, you get a sense of Wharton, that she's a, a person who's interested in balance and order and serenity. Um, <clears throat> but it's not fussy. Uh, it's not excessively feminine or excessively masculine. It's just a lovely, well-planned out house. Worth a trip. This is the one of two photographs I could find of Wharton and Henry James together. This is Henry James, of course, the writer of Daisy Miller and The Real Thing, which we read a few weeks ago. And this is Edith Wharton. Um, they were constant companions. Uh, James, you know, people speculated for years and years about his sexuality, and he was fundamentally a gay man who's very closeted, although he had a variety of, of love affairs. Um, so there was certainly no sexual contact between them, but there was an extraordinary respect for the two of them. Both of them were writers. Both of them came from sort of the same social class in the United States, and both of them chose to live much of their life in Europe. Yet it's hard to imagine two more American writers than this, but they were they traveled together for years. There's all kinds of stories uh, in Wharton's books that talk about their travel books about her trips with Henry James. Um, he was a very, he was older than she was and kind of a fussy guy. Um, but somehow they, they got along and they gave each other, you know, they teased each other all the time uh, as they traveled. But they're fun, interesting, interesting. This is what Wharton looked like in 1930. Again, a successful writer, lived abroad, able to make a living uh, from her own writing. Um, and she's very much in, in many ways like the two women in the short story in that they come from the same social class. They had similar kinds of experiences growing up. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, connections between the two. But this is what she looked like towards the end of her life. So here's our story. It was published in Liberty Magazine in 1934. This is back when most short fiction was published in magazines. Um, and there's essentially four characters in the story, <clears throat> as well as a couple of dead ones. Um, Alita Slade has a daughter named Jenny, uh, and she and her friend Grace Ansley, who both of whom are widows, uh, are visiting Rome with their daughters. And their daughters, uh, Barbara and Jenny, are about the same age that Alita and Grace were 25 years ago when they first met. They were young women looking for husbands in Europe, and they both ended up marrying American men, successful American men, who were also vacationing in Europe at the same time. This is back when rich people could take vacations that lasted for months at a time. Um, they live across the street from each other in New York City. They've always been sort of rivals. And Alita Slade, who's married, her husband's name was Delphin. So she's sometimes identified in the story as Mrs. Delphin Slade in the way that women used to be. Mrs. Husband name, last name. <clears throat> um, my wife hates that. So um, she's always been the superior one. Her husband was a, was a banker, a financier, made a pile of and lived extremely well, had an incredible life, and then he died. Um, 
and she has found being just a widow of Delphin Slate a little hard to take. Grace, her best friend from 30 years ago, has lived across the street from her, um, has led her own interesting life. Her husband is an attorney, uh, and he dies too. He's nowhere near as rich and famous, but he's wealthy enough uh, to give her the kind of life that, that she likes. <laughs> But like I say, Alita has always looked down on Grace. And they were rivals early in their lives when they were both in Rome. They were both after Delphin. And Alita knew that Grace was interested. So there's a point in their early relationship that's related in the story where Alita forges a letter, supposedly from Delphin to Grace, to meet him in the Colosseum at night. And we all know from Daisy Miller, from reading that, that that is um, <clears throat> something that in the period of time when it happens, people thought would get you sick. You'd get malaria if you did that. So Alita, in a way, at one point, wanted was, worth, was willing to kill Grace <laughs> over her, uh, her, both pursuing the same man so she could clear the field for herself. So she writes this letter and, and she, um, she and Grace talk about this letter. Uh, towards the end of the story, Grace says, well, you know, uh, I actually sent the letter back. I sent a letter back. And she describes how Delphin and Grace did, in fact, meet the night before uh, Alita and Delphin were going to announce their engagement. So the, the carefully laid plot that Alita's held on to for years that she tried to kill Grace or at least get Grace very sick um, – fell apart. And she didn't know that. She didn't know that the two actually met. Um, <clears throat> so that's where it gets kind of complicated. So we have this business of letters going on in here. There's a surprise that I won't spoil uh, at the end. But there's a couple of different things that we might want to think about here when we're looking at this story. The first is, are we rereading Daisy Miller? Well, what would happen if Daisy Miller had lived? What if she'd married an American? And what if she came back to Rome? And and you could certainly look at the story as, as that because the characters are so similar. Um, Alita and Grace were like Daisy in the sense that they were Americans who came from wealthy families, went abroad looking for a husband, because that's kind of what women were expected to do back then at this social class. Okay. Um, and of course, the, the stories end very differently. Um, so that's one way to look at this. Is this just an updated version of a Henry James story? We know that James and Wharton were close. James, of course, died in 1916. Um, as you know, but is there a connection between the two? Is is Wharton consciously trying to update this story? I My own feeling is no, because there are other Wharton stories that concern people like the younger versions of these two folks. Um, she has a novel called The Buccaneers about women going abroad looking for British husbands with titles, uh, and that ends well and badly. She also has... Um, novels of, of young people getting married and figuring out how their lives are going to work and things like that. So this is a vein that um, Wharton has mined before, but this particular story stands out again because of the twist at the end. Um, the secret that Grace uh, opens up that she and Delphin really did meet in the Colosseum the night before the big engagement announcement um, shatters uh, Alita Slade's notions of both of grace and of herself. And so that's a that's an interesting bit of business. Uh, you'll see that, that this power of a secret suddenly changes things. The story tells you that they live across the street from each other. And when, you know, when a door opens or a window open or a blind gets up, gets closed or opened, the other house knows it. I mean, they, they live so close to each other that they just watch each other across the street for like 25 years. Um, another thing to think about here is this idea of Americans abroad. And we've talked about this before uh, with Daisy Miller and some of the other stories is that by being abroad, Americans sort of stand out and we see some quote unquote American-like characteristics in a very different light. Things that might not have been revealed in the United States get revealed when people go overseas. And then, of course, the last um, thing to think about, of, at least of the list that I have here, 
I'm sure you smart guys out there can figure out more ways to think about these stories than I can. Um, it's this notion of revenge that, you know, that old saying that revenge is a dish best served cold. Uh, this story certainly uh, represents that. <clears throat> but this will just give you some ideas to think about. Again, with Wharton, one of the things to consider is here's an American who lives a great deal of her life abroad. Uh, a lot of her stories are set overseas, although not all of them. Um, and so when we think about American literature, how does she fit in? And my sense is that Americans show themselves more clearly against a background that that makes them stand out. And I use that notion of a foil, F-O-I-L, a jeweler's foil, a piece of um, metallic fabric that you put behind a gym to show off its facets even better, uh, to make it more exciting looking, more interesting, more intriguing. And I think that's some of what's going on here. I think just the setting adds uh, a frisson of something very different and mysterious and exotic. If this thing were set in St. Louis or even in New York City, I don't think it would have nearly the impact that it does because, again, of the, the setting in Rome, which really is a gorgeous place. Anyway, things to think about. I have just something else to think about is sort of the contrast between the mothers and daughters. And I've got two slides here. This is sort of what um, Alita and Grace would have worn when they were in Rome. Um, these are the kinds of <clears throat> of dresses uh, that they would that they might have worn. And these are sort of stereotypical. Notice the narrow waist. Um, the uh, the relatively broad shoulders this is the construction of a of a corset these are extreme examples of this i mean corsets usually were not as as tight around the waist as we think they are we all have this notion from watching gone with the wind and vivian lee trying to get into one that um that wa waists were cinched in a lot and in some cases they were but these are exaggerated okay but you can also see that just the way the women are are sort of um, posed should remind you a little bit of how Mrs. Monarch is described, the elbow with the orthodox crook, for instance, from that Henry James short story, The Real Thing. But the just to point out here, the, there's very little exposed except for the face. Even the uh, blouse comes up the neck, and so there's not much of that. They always wore hats. Um, the skirts are very long. I mean, you never saw anything more than a woman's foot. Uh, you never saw it like an ankle or anything. I mean, they really were very concerned with with covering themselves up and being very modest. And of course, this follows British and French fashion from the period. And this is the kind of clothes they would have been wearing if they were outside. This is not the stuff that they wore to a ball, to a party, okay, or fancy dinner. This was the kind of clothing that they wore during the day. Well, what did their daughters look like? Well, let's take a look. These are uh, post-World War I dresses. These would have been worn in the 20s, late 20s, early 30s. And you can see they're a lot softer. They're less constructed. They don't require the, the difficult undergarments um, that uh, their mothers would have worn. As you can see, you know, there's no nipped-in waist here or anything. There's a hint of a waist, but it's not anywhere near as exaggerated as the others. We also see the skirts are shorter, arms are bared. It's Rome, it's warm in the, in the spring, summer, and fall, so people would have worn fewer clothes. Over here, this gives you kind of an idea of what party dresses the daughters would have worn. This would have been the kind of thing they wore when they were walking around. Um, again, hats were part of the deal, as you can see here. But the clothing is uh, just different, much freer, much more open. And so you get a sense here, that's why I wanted to point this out, that the daughters are liberated in a way the mothers are not. Yet, the surprise in the story might suggest that this liberation between these two eras of women, mothers and daughters, is much more apparent than real. That things that we think of as going on now, or certainly might have been, you know, looser social mores in the in the 30s when this story was written, as it was in the 1880s and 90s when the, the mothers would have been doing this, or even the turn of the century. Things didn't really change much till World War I um, for about 50 years in terms of how women were regarded. 
uh, you'll notice that the, the one of the women in the story is perhaps far more liberated than we might uh, give her credit for. So this might give you a little bit of an idea of just what these women were wearing, what they might have looked like uh, in the period of time. I'll be interested to see what you have to say uh, about the story. Thank you very much.